hello and welcome to the shiny new object podcast this is a podcast about new marketing technology and every week i have the privilege of interviewing someone entertaining inspiring insightful and this week is no different i'm speaking on the phone to Umarud Tun, who is a creative director at Weber Shandwick. I had the absolute pleasure uh, of meeting Uma initially online via WhatsApp as part of the I'll Be Back WhatsApp group. And that might sound like a lot of weird things to some people, but I co-run an event every month about the intersection of creativity, ads, and AI. And we have a WhatsApp group that kind of unites that community. Um, And Uma is all over that with sharing crazy links and um, very insightful comments. Um, So I was kind of fascinated with her via that. And I was in Singapore last week. And so I sort of begged her for a coffee and and we met up. And it was one of the sort of best meetings I had all week. It was really interesting. And I was like, you will be perfect for the podcast. So Uma, I've given you a big up there. Um, But... Could you tell the audience who who may not know who you are, uh, what you do? Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Tom. Um, What do I do? Well, my great passion is technology, and I'm constantly looking for technology and how to marry new technologies with creative solves to solve business problems. That's what I do in a nutshell. Um. Okay, so let us get to know you. I've prepped you with the getting to know you questions, and apparently there's quite a lot of these for those of you who don't know. Um, and you've you've answered them all, but um, let's let's go through some of them. So, um, as as a creative director, you must sometimes get briefs you're not that excited about, or you might have too much work on. And for a person who's responsible for a team of other creatives what do you do when you feel overwhelmed and unfocused how do you get yourself back on track what do I feel when I get overwhelmed (laughs) well it takes a lot for me to feel overwhelmed Tom you met me I'm highly active and my brains go like um, think a million thoughts at the same time they're like squirrel 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 (laughs) and I actually (laughs) I actually struggle more to slow down to let others catch up to place myself you know at at a work pace that's at the same tempo as them but I do sometimes feel overwhelmed with my own thoughts and, you know, the pace that I've pushed myself to. And when, when I do, I think I take some time to pray and focus. Uh, I really do. I mean, I'm not, not in a crazy, religious, ritualistic manner. I just sit down and chat with my maker honestly and, you know, say I'm at my wit's end and need help. It reminds me I'm human and frail. And, you know, even though I go squirrel, squirrel, squirrel and trying to do a million things, I remember look, I'm limited by this body and what this body can do. And sometimes it just takes an hour of me just playing random songs on my guitar, tears running down my eyes in the quiet moments, in the still of the night, but it works for me. And the sparks of my brains, they just get triggered and refreshed all over again. And writing. I love writing. It's one of those things that comes easy for me. Like I can sit down and write about anything I want to. And it's just, yeah, that calms me as well. So if we could just go back a couple of steps there, uh, religion isn't something that massively features on this niche marketing innovation podcast. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really keen, uh, really keen to, to find out more about that. So without wanting to ask you too personal a question, can you talk to me about how that praying actually works? Do you like go, right, I'm going to do this for an hour you mentioned, or is it a kind of, can you do that at work or like I not being a religious person myself, I have no frame of reference here. So I'm just curious to know okay. how that, how that, okay. relation, how that relationship with you your, your maker helps you creatively. You, okay. So you, you sound like my technologically savvy kids who are constantly questioning God, <laughs> you know, and uh, I keep telling them that God's this guy in this parallel dimension, you know, I think that because we live in this age of technology today and we understand space-time dimensions and the whole concept of, of time and seeing how time could exist in a singularity to enable travel, right? Past, present, future, all existing in one space. Uh, that's, to me, how God exists, past, present, future. And right now in this moment, I, have, I believe in this eternal being who understands where my beginning where I am at and where I'm to be because this eternal being exists in the singularity that 
is past, present, and future all in one. And it, that firstly allows me to have that communication and, and not think, oh, I've gone into my heebie-jeebie archaic world of, of, of religion where, where God's like, you know, some man-made thing, right? And I believe that human beings are beyond just physical beings, right? And that the atmosphere, um, it's, it's past, present, and future, this singularity, and it's charged and supercharged with so, ideas and creativity. So, so, what, so what effect does that have on unblocking you? So when I, when I have this understanding and believe that, that when I connect with this being, um, I am getting ideas from past, present, and future. And mm. those, I, I have access to that, you know, there's that clear channel and I need to focus and get to that place where I can have those ideas transmitted into me. It's just so, sorry, sorry to be completely space. flippant here, but does, does, your, does your maker have all the answers to the briefs that you can't answer? I don't think my maker is going to give me all the answers to the briefs <laughs> I can't answer. That's, that's, but does, that does he have the answers though? I think he's got enough ideas to get me started on where I want Brilliant. to go. <laughs> you know, you, everyone's got their sauce. I've got mine. And, and, you, and you also mentioned writing, that you, you have the ability just to write about anything at any length. Um, so, love, if you, yeah, I, so, so if you're going to try and um, re-motivate yourself or, or unblock yourself creatively, what, what would you write? What, you know, what have you done in the past that's helped solve that uh, kind of creative sticking point okay it takes me away from from the little rut that i sometimes get stuck in for example um i remember when i was a uh, global creative director on pawns right and you know there's only so much you can do campaign after campaign year after year on on whitening creams right <laughs> so i've actually had to do Sometimes you just need to walk away from that and write about something different. And that's where technology, I think writing about technology has been my salvation. I've got this, this hunger for like science fiction and future and space and aliens. And I'm constantly reading up on them. And sometimes moving away from what I'm working on, like widening, widening cream and sitting down and writing about you know, future technology, like the internet of people and, and putting chips or, 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 or uh, even nanotechnology or like ultra nanotechnology into, into human beings so that you can biologically track people, their behavior uh, and writing about that, writing my thoughts on that, that helps ground me. <laughs> Strangely, that's how I relax. So you described a, a kind of yin and yang, a that I have felt quite a lot when working in advertising that no matter how interesting the client is, you know, repetition can sometimes sort of get you stuck in a rut. And yes. then, you, then you read something on a, uh, you know, a tech futures website and your kind of brain explodes with excitement about the possibilities of whether it's brain computer interfaces or travel to Mars or, or you know, whatever. Absolutely, yes. However, there's that, then that creates a, a gulf between the, the mundanity of the day to day and the excitement of what's coming tomorrow. And I think the middle ground between those two things is probably the innovation director, right? That person who's trying to kind of drag the future, <laughs> in, dra drag the future into the present, if you like. So how, um, so it's brilliant that writing about technology unlocks your creative brain, but then how do you take that understanding about something like the internet of people and pass that on to your clients? A lot of, okay, so now I have the pleasure of working on a lot of technology brands. Okay, I, I can't say that when I was working on a widening cream, um, a lot of the technology translated in the platforms that I was executing on because the type of communication, what I'm gonna communicate creative with, creatively would still be about whitening creams and, 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 and the features of it or what it does for people. But the platforms and the way I bring that to life, like, you know, the type of innovative media that's there, uh, that's where, you know, I, I get excited about technology. But today, um, in, in the space that I am at, I've actually moved away from that. And now I'm looking at, at uh, every single client that come, brief that comes to me for a comms idea. And I'm saying, okay, here's your comms solve, but look, We've got this other technology solved that, that solves your business innovation. For example, 
um, I had a client come and say, okay, I, I need some stuff for this campaign. And then I was like, okay, great. Here's, here's your campaign solved. Here's the creative idea. But you know what you really need? You're trying to reach people. Your end objective is uh, to get more people to buy into your service. Um, here's a cleverer technology solve for you to do that. Why don't you create a social platform on top of the app that you already have? And this social platform actually connects people with different needs. And then when they get on the social platform and they start sharing their needs, they're able to invite their friends on board. And it almost becomes a space for like barter trade where people can exchange ideas, people of the same sector. And as they exchange ideas, you are collecting data. And when you collect data, it allows you to target the people you're speaking to better, you know? So, so that's interesting. I'm, I'm, so, yeah. so, you, so you answer the brief in the traditional fashion yes, and then you, totally. then, you, then you go, well, I've answered your brief and now here's a, a whole extra thing. Yeah, well, yeah. Why don't, and, nice and, thing, and if the whole extra sorry. thing, if the whole extra thing is right, why didn't you just offer them that first? Because they will not be open if they think that you're not hitting your brief in the first, uh, you know, to begin with, right? Clients, they have their own expectations to manage. So you need to manage the expectations first. They've given you a problem to solve um, and their brains are working within certain constraints. If you don't manage those constraints, you will never be able to sell the extra that you want to. Right. That is a yes. that is a, an ex <laughs> excellent excellent answer. Yeah, I, mean, I love I love the yeah. approach. So, yeah. in terms of you, and I'm talking about your your personal time, uh, your personal money, or your personal energy. What has been yeah. the best, your best investment of that in your career? So, not like yeah. So, what when you've sort of given time, money, or, or energy to something outside of work? What has been the best investment of that within your career? Okay, that would be um, doing my master's in digital media and technology at Hyper Island. So Hyper Island is a Swedish university. They, they're fairly new in Singapore. They've been around for like five years or six years, I think. And um, no, a bit more than that. Oh my God, yes. And when I joined Hyper Island, honestly, I, I quit my job at Saatchi because I wanted to do something different. And I, did, I, I reached a point where I thought, I don't believe in advertising anymore. Advertising sucks, right? This is it, you know, I'm going to leave this place. I had two young kids to raise. I was, and then I got a job at Ogilvy during my first, um, first month at Hyper Island. I don't know that, how that happened because I basically went in and told the people that interviewed me, I don't believe in our advertising. And the next day they called me and said, here's a job for you. Can, I, really gracious of them. can I just take you back one step? So yeah. um, I think that we all in this industry from time to time have that feeling of, as you said, advertising sucks. We can all relate to that. So what was it specifically at Saatchi's that made you feel like that? I'm not, I'm not looking for a critique of Saatchi specifically, but I just want to understand better what was going on in your head to make you so disenfranchised with the industry that you went, fuck it, I'm just going to stop. Um, okay, that's very easy. It's, it wasn't just Saatchi. I mean, Saatchi was a really fun place to work at. Okay. And uh, I think it wasn't, it was at the way, People in advertising solve problems, right? It's never been about solving the problem. It's always been about coming up with a new campaign, a new campaign idea, this, this new shiny object, or it's, it's comparing what the other guy's doing and taking that, doing something completely opposite and different because you think um, that's what the client's asking for. But no, I, I think when clients come to you, what they basically are asking you to do is to solve a problem for them, right? So it's solving for X, whatever that X may be. And I don't see that happen enough. Nobody actually takes time to identify the problem. And then, you know, it's it, all, all, the few who do, I mean, they're like brilliant, right? Mavericks out there. And then, and then you get a really great campaign that solves a business problem or solves a need. But you barely see that in advertising. What you see are really great, beautiful campaigns. You know, the craft is beautiful. It's highly entertaining. But to what end? And that was where I was feeling this, this um, loss inside me. Like, what am I doing with this? I'm creating shiny new things. I'm sorry, Tom. It sounds a lot like the name of your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no relation to that. What's not, what Tom's doing is amazing, but you know, we, we kept creating these things. But to what end? 
it had no purpose or not a strong enough purpose for me to feel that that what I did mattered enough. I wanted to matter, you know. And so then you went to Hyper Island. And what, what was your what was your motivation to get a master's from Hyper Island? What did you want to get out of that process? Okay, I didn't really care about the master's, honestly, but everyone was talking about Hyper Island. Uh, you know, like you, it, it gives you a sense of purpose. It teaches you to look at technology differently. It introduces you to, um, it, it was supposed to be the cool new shit, you know, when it came to technology. So I thought, great, I need this, you know, because I love technology. Let's go see what happens. And I'm so glad I did it because the learning curve was really high. They didn't tell me what to do. Instead, really, I learned how to solve for X in my own way. Uh, rather than giving you the tools, they started teaching you how to find the tools you need. And it wasn't just about technology. It was about design thinking. And you got to work with like people who, who the teachers, you know, the guys who came in to give you your lectures, a lot of them... Uh, especially especially in the early days of Hyper Island. I was like a year two student when we started and they came from Sweden and they had done their startups and they talked about their failures and their successes and um, growth hacking and how Uber and Airbnb uh, was set up. And it was a completely different approach to marketing and, and branding from advertising. So I learned so much there and I got to take that to Oh, I tried my best to take some of that to Ogilvy when I started working there. So you said something really interesting there, which was they didn't teach you how to use the tools. They taught you to find the tools. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Because on, on one level, that sounds a bit like just Google some stuff, but I'm sure it's much more complex than that. I'm just interested yeah, to know it's, how it's, that it's actually yeah, so, so basically un until, okay, so people can tell you that, oh, you need to go look for tools for this, but until they force you into an environment where, where um, you know, it, it's your modules and you're going to be graded for it and you need to be clever and, and, um, and creative about the type of th tools that you're finding. So, for example, when we were doing... Um, we were doing growth hacking, right? We need to, we needed to like scrape data and you basically got like an hour course on how to scrape data, but everybody knows that one hour learning from, from like nothing to going to scraping data. Um, you walk away going, what? So for my project, I needed to scrape data from, I'm not going to tell you where, beep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and get some information and then use that information to hack behavior and then get X result for a certain company, right? And I needed to de demonstrate that that was achieved. Um, and that was what, or, or fail doing it. And that's the best thing about Hype Island, right? You don't need to succeed, but it's your learnings that matter. So that forced me to start digging the internet like, like, what do I need? How do I do this? And, and because I needed to achieve an outcome, um, I started putting it to practice and then I started comparing tools and, and I started thinking, okay, this is the easiest one to use. Let's do this. And then I started learning how to not just scrape data. I, I started learning how to scrape data um, in different ways for different purposes. In this case, it was to hack behavior and to, you know, the growth hack and to increase um, the number of people who are buying into this product in this particular hour of the day and demonstrate how I did it. But so, so that's a really interesting story about how you learned a new skill under a lot of pressure and then yeah, you yeah, yeah. reapply that stuff. So um, moving from a, a skills perspective to a kind of a more of a, like in a game mental perspective, what, what new beliefs or behaviors have you picked up from the Hyper Island experience? or in, in agency life that has, has changed the way that you work in the last five years? I think the clearest one was, was how to solve business problems, basically. So solving for X versus coming up with another campaign. So it helped me um, be clear and focused and plow through the mud, especially when it came to insights and, and ideas, um, uh, human insights, uh, using data, and how to find that data and how to interpret the data correctly to find the problem to begin with and then work backwards to solve that problem. So, so I love, that's so I, 
I, I really love this idea of solving for X and I love the idea of going to the, the root cause of what the client is actually trying to achieve. But, um, and on, on a theoretical level, hundred percent. And how yeah. do you deal with a situation where the client comes to you and says, uh, I want to, I want a Snapchat campaign and I want it to go live in three weeks. Like the, the you're not really solving for X there. You're coming up with, coming up with what you'd said before, which was like, okay. that was an, you know what a campaign idea. I know, and, so, I know. So, and if you turn around to the client and say, look, I know you think you want a Snapchat campaign, but like, what are you really trying to solve? Let's solve for X and let's to scrape in the data. They go, no, 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 it's got to go live in two weeks. So how, how do you deal with the, the reality of clients who want a very specific thing in a very short amount of time with your sort of Californian, like solving for X, like, you know, um, <laughs> okay. semi, semi Swedish, um, like uh, utopian view of advertising. Okay. So um, actually I've had clients do that. That's happened to me in the past three weeks repeatedly. <laughs> the clients come back and said, yeah, in fact, one, one just did that uh, last Friday and said, I want this, right? So you know what I did? Um, I worked with one team, you know, just, just two guys, because if you, they didn't want a Snapchat campaign, they wanted an Instagram campaign. <laughs> so I worked with two guys and said, listen, okay, so this is the Instagram campaign, but uh, let's sit down and think for ourselves based on data we can get around the client's business. What is it that the client needs to achieve, right? And we actually sat down and we found some data and uh, we managed to work, work it backwards to like, okay, so this is a problem you're having and this is how much money you're losing based on this data that we have. Um, you might know this, you might not know this, but here's where we got the data from. And I just did like the first, my first three slides were basically maths, <laughs> you know, to show the numbers. And I said, okay, this is how much you stand to make, even in the number of reach, if you were to do this, because this is the real problem you're solving for. And then I said, here's an Instagram campaign that would support and enable this. I've done your part. But what you really need is here. This is the part two. This is a long-term solve, but it would if our numbers are correct, I mean, we still need some numbers from the client, which I didn't have, right? I said, and I still need some numbers from you. Then I think this is the average amount we, we can improve on the loss that you're making in this area. And do they buy it? The client told me no one's come to them and given them mats in the first few slides, <laughs> you know, numbers that actually matter to the business outcome or, or the client's own personal little, little marketing target outcome. You didn't answer the question. Did they buy it? Yeah. Um, no, uh, they're talking monies now <laughs> for the Instagram <laughs> campaign. But, you know, I just showed them another way of doing it. <laughs> I, I, like it, it doesn't matter. I need to feel that I've tried, you know, Tom, because if I don't, I mean, what am I existing for? So I am reading, <laughs> I, I, I really hate reading successful business books because if they're successful business books, they mean that everyone else has read them. So I kind of feel that I'm just sort of playing catch up as opposed to forging ahead, but that's my insecurity. I'm reading a book called Principles by Ray Dalio, uh, who's sort of there. Uh, head honcho at um, Bridgewater, some investment firm. And the whole book is about like how to, how to you know, manage people, how to create a strategy uh, for the business. And, and one of his things is never have a debate based on opinion. Um, always have a, a debate based on data. So no matter what yeah. it is, whether it's hiring someone or making a creative decision or a strategic decision, so I'd get as many trusted subject matter experts as you can find and get them all to bring data and everyone get, get everyone's data out on the table so that everyone has visibility of a problem from all different perspectives and then make a decision based on that. And I think that what you've, you've described there of you've done a, a huge part of that, which is go and find some data about the client's business and then talk about a creative solution based on that, I think is, is brilliant. And that's a, and as you say, that's a, that's a very progressive state, step forward beyond the kind of just creating nice shit on, on channels because it looks cool and it's a nice campaign, right? Yeah. So, I, so yeah. I, even if they don't buy it, man, I, I, yeah. I tried, yeah, I tried. I can yes. sleep easy at night. 
I, I Say, love that. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't give in. I tried. Yeah. So, um, so in the in the last few years, what have you become better at saying no to at work? No to meetings. Oh my God, there were days when I used to attend just meetings after meetings after meetings. People in our industry love to meet for the sake of meeting. They have meetings about meetings. So now I've, I've, I just ask, you know, very simple questions when I'm invited to a meeting. What's the meeting about? What's my role in this meeting? Am I expected to contribute or am I going to be a piece of decoration at the meeting? And if those questions don't get answered, I just decline and don't attend. Right. And so do you have like an email template that you just fire out to people? Yes, it ends with meeting suck. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't. But, but I think I've done it enough uh, that people, especially now at Weber, they kind of know how I work. So it's like, I've got this much time. Let's make it effective. Because I heard an interesting view recently about meetings that before you had like synced up calendars and Outlook or Google or whatever, you used mm -hmm. to have to like call someone and go, hey, Uma, there's a meeting this afternoon about ponds. And then it was much harder to do that than to just ping them an invite. Because you can just add people on a, on a calendar invite, just bang in 15 people and everyone, yeah. and everyone has to deal with that, right? Whereas... Um, if you had to go up to 15 people, A, that takes loads of time, and B, you'd have to go to each person and deal with those questions. Yeah. So actually the efficiency of Google Outlook or whatever has kind of created a problem for us because, yes, you definitely need to answer those questions. Yes. I think the mobile phone and all mobile devices that we have has created a problem for us because, yeah, you know, you are accessible anytime, anywhere. And... Uh, there's this very rude expectation that <laughs> you, you should answer. And especially when you're, you're working remotely. Uh, yeah, there's a very rude expectation that you need to answer and attend or, or just, just call into a meeting all the time. So yes. we are kind of slightly over halfway now so we've got to know you and, and, uh, and, and, <laughs> Great. and thank you for all of those brilliant answers but now we've got to get to the to the meat of the podcast which is the shiny new object of which you said you should not get distracted by um thank you for calling out the the ironic, <laughs> the ironic title of this podcast. That's fine um what is your shiny new object and can you describe it in plain english to the listeners okay Okay, I'm a big fan of 3D printing, right? A big fan. Not plastics and metal thingies and building parts and cars and all that, but food, 3D printing food. You know, because companies like Nova Meat, they're creating 3D printed steak. Even Richard Branson's... Sorry, uh, sorry, best. sorry. Some people have no idea what you're talking about. So what was the name of the business that are printing 3D printing steak? Okay, so Nova Meat in America, they're creating 3D printed steak. Steak. And what was steak. the name of the business? Nova. I couldn't hear you. Nova. N O V A. Nova. Nova. Yeah. Meat. Nova. Meat. <laughs> yeah, Nova. So, how are they 3D printing steak? Tell me that. So, they've got different chemical components that come together uh, to create what tastes, looks, and feels when you chew into it like steak. Even Richard Branson is investing in vegan steak. Millions of dollars are being invested in startups that are 3D printing food. And this, and is, and of, this is meat that's made out of plants, basically. Yeah, plants are just chemical components that, that uh, feel like plants, but edible. Okay. So but, your shiny... <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds... No, no, um, I, it I'm sounds very different. interested. So your, your shiny new object is 3D printing food. So... Tell me how that is relevant to marketing. Uh, okay, so I got to talk a little bit about where it's headed first. So okay. a lot of it is in, is in testing stage now. Um, and the great thing about it is it's sustainable. There's no killing of any animals. It reduces the carbon footprint. Uh, no more cow, you know, mad cow diseases. And it helps feed the multitude. So that's, that's like, oh, that's my little e utopia of 3D printed food, right? Because food is a basic necessity and this is so needed. But less, and especially in first world situations, you know, let's face it, people don't eat for nutrition. 
we eat for pleasure. Do you think, do you go to lunch and think about, oh, I need, you, you, when you're guilty, you go, okay, I need to eat some salad today. But really, if you had the option and there was this beautiful piece of food laid before you that's so yummy and scrumptious, would you order that? Right? We try to discipline ourselves, but our natural inclination as humans is to indulge texture, flavor, this explosion of senses, right? So every time I think of 3D printed food, I think, do you watch Star Trek, Tom? I have seen Star Trek. I would not Okay, I, I'm a, a, okay, a Trekkie, all right? I, I just, and the latest Star Trek's awesome, right? Discovery. So is, 3D, that the, uh, is that the Netflix one? Yeah. I have seen, so I saw the first episode. Oh with the, uh, the weird yeah, alien. The, 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 weird, the weird alien that can make a ship fly through time. I just thought, no, I'm not Yeah, the mycelial anyway. drive. That's what it's called. The mycelial <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> okay. So 3D food printers are essentially like Star Trek food replicators, right? And, and the amazing thing about it is, imagine what the future would be. We've got wearable technology. We've got devices that tell us how much nutrition our body needs, right? Um, and they use different in, uh, ingredients and chemicals and engineered proteins and carbs and other components found naturally in food to replicate a dish or a meat or even like a really good whiskey. That's the future, right? The concept of, of advanced 3D printing. But imagine if we could adjust that food because it's 3D printed to contain the nutrition that your body needs and the carb intake that your body needs. No one would be overweight, right? No one would ever be malnutritioned, right? So, so when you want lunch and you're ordering a burger, it could be like a two-calorie burger, which tastes exactly like your favorite burger from your favorite joint because it's 3D printed to meet the calorie and the nutrition needs of your body. So that's where I see the future of food and 3D printed food. Okay, in terms of marketing, what this could be is, thing is, if this was used, you know, by magnanimous countries and governments to feed the multitude great but i also see this as something that only the rich might end up getting their hands on because it's basically it doesn't just end world hunger it has the power to right but it also has the power to extend life longevity uh, immortality because we are what we eat the nutrition we get you know imagine if if, if um medication could be dispensed within the food you eat. So it doesn't taste like medication. It doesn't have unpleasant flavors, but everything you need is in that food. It's also a fitness thing, right? So fitness companies could be using this, right? To, to now deliver nutrition and food that's packed in a way to give you the type of muscles that you need to develop or, or the type of figure, you know, that you want to develop. So you would never get fat eating. Okay. Ah, so, so that's where I see it going, <laughs> where marketing is concerned. I think the greedy and the rich are going to eventually get their hands on it. And right. Okay. So, it. yeah. So let's move from the Ethiopia across to the, 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 its dark side. So, yeah. so realistically, to have, let's just, let's just try and work out what might more possibly happen. So, you, so yeah. it's a machine that you presumably have a bunch of different chemicals or ingredients that can synthesize yeah. whatever, a burger, a hot dog, a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. To, tea, whatever. To so these things are going to be so unbelievably expensive that the, it's it's probably going to be like a, a university or a or a Google that you know has the first one in their canteen or something. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's the one percent that are going to get access to this. To begin with, as with all technology. Yes. Right. Eventually, hopefully, there would be people who are, you know. So your Elon I, Musk's and your Richard Branson's hopefully have big enough hearts to make it available to the masses so that and, people can be fed. And so what's the middle ground? What is the, like, okay, so you've got a, like a machine in every tube station, train station that, that can make this burger that's two, two calories that, you know, fills you full of potassium. I, okay. What is the middle ground? What is the, what is the kind of MVP, if you like, for this kind of tech? Is it a drink? Is it a snack bar? Like what? I think it could okay. It could start with a with a basic like maybe a snack bar in your kitchen, like a tiny little piece, like quick food, right? Like like fast food in your kitchen, 
like every house could have one and it makes basic food. But I think eventually it will be so big that um, it would change the way we live. I mean, imagine no animals get killed. The vegans are happy, right? Uh, there's no, it's like an anti-waste culture because it only creates based on what you want, right? So environmentally, it's going to be amazing. Um, but it's, it could also deliver the opposite where sitting down and getting a home co cooked meal suddenly becomes, I don't know, maybe illegal because suddenly, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Suddenly in, in the future, uh, killing an animal or cutting a plant because they're so rare and, and so few and so, so protected that it, it, it's, why would you want to do that when you've got a replicator in your home, right? A food 3D printer in your home, right? So to sit down and, 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 and have Mama Joe's Italian spaghetti, is, uh, it's not the same. Suddenly, home-cooked meals become the luxury. It does the reverse. So, so calories become a luxury, yeah. So in the same way that the mobile phone has made us accessible 24-7 you know, anywhere in the world to join a meeting about meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what are the downsides of this technology? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a huge traditionalist when it comes to food. Like the, 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 <laughs> so the, am I. The, the, process, so of buy, the I. process of buying food, preparing food for the people that I love and, and like spending time with is, is the biggest joy in my life. Like no question. So the idea there's going to be a fucking replicator <laughs> that's going to make me a, like a... I, no, it might make a you a snack bar, but it drives me up the wall. Look, it's going to be AI powered, right? So whatever it delivers, it's going to give you the pleasure that the food that your mom made or whoever made for you gives you. But but so, I disagree. I disagree. It's the process that is exactly. Uh, but but the knowing that it wasn't made by your mom, yeah, that that kind of takes away half the joy, right? So I, I think I, I talked a bit about the downside. The downside is that, yeah, what, what if, you know, in this future, because, because this is perceived as the way of life, right? That it is the thing that's done because humanity wants to save the environment. Humanity wants a zero waste culture, right? Uh, humanity wants um, to feed the masses and we don't want to destroy and kill other living beings suddenly having your mom come in and cook the way she did is illegal. Suddenly the old way of life, the, the way that, that we are accustomed to, it becomes extinct. Human okay. culture, yeah, food culture, and what we know as food processed from our kitchen has become extinct. So how right. sad is that? So <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really early in the morning here and I'm quite confused by this, but anyway, it's fine. So um, how, how does a marketer listening to this podcast start to deal with some of these ideas and how do some of your ideas impact what they're doing today? I think it changes the way people market fitness, right? So no longer do you need a fitness center. Fitness is being delivered in your home from your kitchen. Right, so nutrition and all that. It, it changes the way you look at healthcare, right? Doctors and, and pharmaceutical companies can now deliver nutrition via this replicator. It changes the way you look at beauty because I mean, a lot of collagen intake and all that uh, stuff that you used to drink, right, in those vials are now delivered via a replicator. So, how do you get your market share in this future? How do you, how do you, um, in, become the first one when this comes to market to introduce it right maybe you could even start with a with a beauty replicator where different based on your your skincare needs it it produces food or or, or uh, 3d prints wiles and drinks that you need to have better skin rather than than going to a mall or going to your to your um beauty specialist to buy these things uh, right. maybe for yeah yeah at the start of this conversation i really didn't think we were gonna finish with 3d printing beauty health drinks uh, 
so, <laughs> that's just, it's so, full circle. which is which is just yeah. um absolutely fantastic um we're gonna have to <laughs> wrap it up there um okay. when you said at the start of this conversation that your brain goes squirrel 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 i was uh, slightly confused by what you meant but i think i've got a good understanding now um and thanks for sharing your insight into how you do a good job how you inspire and and reset yourself creatively uh, thanks for being so open about you know the sort of the disappointments and the, and the, the decisions you've made um, and thanks for talking about 3d printing of food <laughs> I, I literally no idea that existed um I, I i just feel terrified for your clients when you so we <laughs> so what we've done is we've answered your instagram brief but what we're going to do now is 3d print a burger with two calories in it <laughs> I am, being, well, I, am, I am being flippant, and I, as a joke, I take that back. So, Uma, yeah. if people wanted to get in touch with you to discuss any of these things, how would you like them to do that? Okay, they can uh, check me out on LinkedIn. Um, I'm quite active on it. It's can Uma you, Radchia. Can you, can you spell that for us in the UK? It's Uma, U-M-A, like Uma Thurman. Rudd, R-U-D-D, um, like Paul Rudd, who is Ant-Man. And chia, C H I A, like the seed, chia seed. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And you could also write me at uma.tan, T A N, most common Chinese surname in the world, at hyperisland.sg. Brilliant. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, thanks for the other day as well. That was a brilliant conversation. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Yes, I look forward to seeing you too, Tom. Thanks for having me. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye.